<clears throat> but we got thinking the other day that maybe we don't invite a lot of people to the church because we don't know how. So Carl and I thought we would teach you a little bit this morning. The wrong and the right. Watch. Knock, 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 Joe! Oh my gosh, what in Joe, the... are you home? Hey, babe, somebody's at the door. Would you get the door? I hear you. I saw your light was on, Joe. Oh, it's Carl. I know you're home, Joe. Knock, 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 knock. What are you doing? Oh. Knock, 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 knock. Knock, knock, Joe! Oh, hey, how are you doing? Oh, hi, Carl. How you doing, yeah, pal? Yeah, come, come on in. Great. Come, come on Should in. Should I take my shoes off? My uh, feet got this fungus, and I just got to let them breathe. You know what? Just, just leave them on. That's, okay. that's probably good. Hey, so listen. So, well, I was kind of busy, so what Oh, perfect. I... I'll make this quick. Um, <sighs> Is everything okay? Sorry, my mouth just got real dry. <sighs> you need a mint or something? No, I'm okay. Thanks. My breath drink. is always good. Oh, yeah. So, hey, so... You know yeah. that thing I do on Sundays? Yeah. That thing I do? Um, golfing, you mean? No, the other thing. Uh, walking your dog, yeah. Church. I'm a Christian, Joe. Oh. I'm a Christian. Okay, I didn't know that. All right. Oh, you didn't know? Yeah. I kind of made it obvious with the nativity scene in my front yard and the cross in my front yard. Uh, I, I guess I should have guessed. And big ceramic yeah. Jesus in my front yard. I so I was wondering. Mm. I was wondering. You okay? I'm okay. Do you want to come to church with me on Sunday? We're having a potluck. Um, uh, this Sunday. This Sunday. Um, um, well, you know what? Yeah. Dad, my wife and yeah. I will check our schedule and, um, and see what we can do. How's that? Okay. I well, don't know what thanks. time it is or anything, but I'll text you. I'll text you, you. Wait a minute. You have my number? I got it from the internet. I'll text you. I know how much you like when I text you, so I'll text you the information. Sure, sure. They told me on Sunday, but I wasn't paying attention. Yeah, you, I, I think we'll, tr we'll see what we can do. You want me to come hey. over for dinner tonight? Well, you want me to stay? <laughs> I'm not sure what Debbie's cooking, but so maybe we'll another time. Hey, Joe. Yeah, we'll see okay, you later. Okay, bye, buddy. Yeah, bye. Love you. Yeah. Okay. So maybe a not so good idea, right? So getting in somebody's face, uh, invading their personal space, their personal time. I told him I was busy uh, and a few other things. Uh, he's got bad breath. He's in my face. So you at least use the mint when you're inviting somebody. Okay, you good? Is that, is that good enough? And, and he didn't know the time. He just was inviting me to an event. He didn't know the time. And, just, and I was supposed to know all about him, but it didn't so well. So maybe a little different approach to this. Hey, 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 Carl, Carl. What? Can, can you, can you just turn the, turn the hammer off? What's well, not electric? <laughs> yeah. Oh, the, dr oh, the drill. Yeah, oh, yeah. the drill. Hey. Hey, Carl, how hey, you doing, I'm man? Good, man? It's how been a while yourself? since yeah, I've seen you. Hey, listen, our church is, I, I, and you're obviously really busy here. It's a bench. It's a bench, Working and it's bench. looking good. Thanks. It's looking really good, man. You do some fine work, I got to tell you. You got a minute? I can just just uh, chat with you for sure. Some... I do. Sure, great. Hey, listen, our church has got an event going on. I brought this beautiful um, invitation that the church made for us. So there's a couple things going on. There's some choir that we're doing, the adults, and then our children are doing a thing. You could bring the kids along. Perfect. And inside, if you come, there's a free candy bar. Now that's kind of cool. I mean, if going to church and getting a free candy bar, you can't really go wrong with that but listen all the information's on here that you need to know the time the place the date so oh, that's i just want to leave this buddy. for you and vicky and oh. if you want to bring millie along too there's a place for her but we'd love to have you guys just didn't want to take much of your time just wanted to invite you thanks and, man is that my pen uh, that's it's yours your pen. Uh, you okay. can have it but hey thanks. we'll don't, see you later and love to see you guys love to yes. see you guys Excellent. been great neighbors oh, appreciate you thanks, all PJ. right love you buddy okay a little different scenario let's give carl a hand So just being aware of people's 
space and having something in your hand that you can give to them kind of takes all the pressure off. You don't have to remember all the dates because your hands are sweating and you're nervous about what you're going to say and when you're going to say it and how you're going to do it. Just a little invite card. So we have some of those, interestingly enough, this morning for you on the back table. Uh, they're green. The front of them are green. It invites the friends of yours, family of yours to our uh, Christmas cantata that we'll have and then our follow-up with our kids Christmas program and uh, the following week on the 15th. But those are on the back table. There's some also in the foyer. I would encourage you just to grab a couple of those on your way out this morning and then ask the Holy Spirit who we would want you to invite. Is that easy enough? All right, and let the Holy Spirit just lead you to someone and invite somebody to church and let it be a blessing to you. What to see? <clears throat> keep feeling like I want to be down here lately. I'm not sure what's happening with that, but it's all good. Well, we've been in our series with um, the kingdom culture, and I hope it's made an impact on your life. Uh, we often talk about the difference between what the church looks like, what the kingdom looks like. They should be one in the same. Can somebody say amen? The church and the kingdom should be one. That's, that was the intention. When God called out, the Greek word we use, the ecclesia, the called out ones, when he called them out, he called them out of uh, a world system, out of a corrupt, sinful system, and he called them, the scripture says, he called us into his marvelous light. And that light is, is the kingdom of God that shines abroad in our hearts and causes us to act and respond to the king of the kingdom in a way that's honoring to him and honoring to his body that is filling all the earth. Aren't you glad for brothers and sisters around the globe with hundreds of thousands of brothers and sisters that one day you and I, when we get to heaven, this body will all be united. These fleshly bodies will be shed. Can somebody say hallelujah? This fleshly body will be shed and our new body, the glorified body, will be put on. Uh, this, this thing does not look anything like that thing will look. This perishable is going to put on imperishable. This corruption is going to put on incorruption. How, somebody should be shouting right now here. I know a few of you got some pains in the house. You should be saying, God, even so, Lord Jesus, come, right? And so that day is going to come. But until then... On this side of heaven, you and I get to fellowship with one another on a personal level with all of our faults, all of our quirks, and all of our idiosyncrasies that we have and learn to get along. Why can't we be friends? Right? The songwriter says. And so as we continue the culture of the kingdom today, I want to talk specifically today about uh, the many parts in the body of Christ, in the culture of the kingdom, the many parts that we have. But before I do, it's Thanksgiving uh, week. Some of you uh, this next week here will be going away to family. Debbie and I will be leaving for Atlanta to go see our daughter, son-in-law, and two grandbabies. And uh, looking forward to that and eating lots of food. And I saw, saw a sign, and I think it was Walmart yesterday, it said, Happy Thanksgiving, don't eat too much. And I said, not me, I'm going to eat a lot on that day. And I uh, love, love Thanksgiving Day. Hallelujah. Well, there was a man who uh, bought a parrot. Big mistake, first of all. Uh, and he only, had, only to have it constantly insult him all day long. He tries everything to make the parrot stop, but nothing could make the parrot stop. I mean, it didn't matter what he tried, the parrot insulted him all day long. So frustrated, the man puts the parrot in the freezer. After a few minutes, the parrot quieted down, the insult stopped. He's thinking, this is pretty good. So the th man, after a little bit, thinks, well, maybe I killed the poor guy. So he goes over to the lid of the freezer, lifts it up, and sure enough, there's the parrot. And the parrot's shivering. <laughs> and he stammers, Sorry, I've been so rude to you. Please forgive me. And then after a moment, the parrot asks, 
What did the turkey do? <laughs> Thought that was cute. Some of you will get it in a few minutes. And you'll start laughing in the middle of my serious message. Now the scripture tells us that the kingdom of God in Luke 17, 20, 21, that the kingdom of God is not a physical thing. And we can't see it. And Jesus said, the kingdom is within you. One translation says, the kingdom is among you. How many know if it's in me and I'm with you, it's among us? Amen? The kingdom of God is within you. It's within you. Matthew 6, 30 through 33. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you? O oh, you of little faith, so do not worry, saying, what are we going to eat? What are we going to drink? And what are we going to wear? For the pagans run after all these things. For the pagans run after all these things. He's showing us a contrast here. For the pagans run after all these things and yet your heavenly father knows what you need can somebody say thank you father, thank you, father. he knows what you need this morning but seek first the kingdom of God seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things what things? What are you going to eat? What are you going to wear? What are you going to drink? All these things will be added unto you. If your heavenly Father knows how to clothe the flowers of the field, the grass of the field, how much more does he know how to take care of you? Amen? So what is he saying to us in these verses? He's saying we need to get our attention off this physical world. Isn't that what he's saying to us? How much time do we worry about what we're going to eat? Some of you might have put preparation on today while you're at church. You've got a roast cooking in the oven. Sometimes before we go to work, Debbie will take some meat out of the fridge or the freezer so that it's ready when we get home. There's preparation that we make for all these physical things. Some of you last night before you went to bed, you got your outfit ready for today. Some of you woke up and pulled it out of the drawer and threw it on, but you knew you had something to wear. If you're a lady, you want to make sure you're up in style with everybody and you notice sister so-and-so had those new shoes on and so you had to get the new shoes. And we worry so much about all the physical stuff. That's what the pagans do, the scripture says. He's saying to you, body of Christ, to us, body of Christ, that shouldn't be your focus in this world. And what you're going to wear, what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink. But, seek the kingdom. Be diligent about chasing after the kingdom of God and his righteousness. The king and his righteousness. Aren't you glad when you got saved, you took on a new robe called the righteousness of Christ? And no longer do we have to depend on our goodness to be seen fit for the kingdom of God. Can anybody say amen today? I don't know about you, but given over to my own desires and making, I'm probably not the best person in the world. But because of the righteousness of Christ, I become pretty special. 
I've become one of the king's kids. I'm a chosen one. Uh, the Bible says I'm a royal priesthood, a holy nation set apart for the glory of God. Hallelujah. Amen? We become somebody special. Philippians chapter 4, verse 19, one quick verse. And my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. The king knows that we're body, soul, and spirit. In other words, he knows that you have needs. Although we are part of a kingdom, we are spiritual beings, we are also fleshly beings. And our body, along with the whole earth, is groaning for its redemption. And so that's why we say, Maranatha, even so, Lord Jesus, come, so that this transformation can take place. But the greater, deeper, and more eternal purpose is to have uh, such an intimate relationship with the Father that we can serve Him as ambassadors of His kingdom to a lost and a dying world. Let me rephrase that for us this morning. If we're more concerned about how we look than we are the lost, we've lost focus on the kingdom. If we're more concerned with how we look than how the lost are dying and going to hell, we are going to miss the kingdom. I was listening this week about a man who supposedly, whether it's true or not, I don't know, I'll leave that between him and the Lord, but supposedly went to hell and saw the torment and the torture there. And the vacuum of hope, the vacuum of love, the vacuum of any satisfaction. And you and I can't imagine what that's like to live in a place like that eternally without any presence or uh, acknowledgement of God at all. One of the things he said that caught my attention is that you can, you, you can reject God now. You have the privilege to do that. But when you get hell because you've rejected the God, you also get that as well. So reject him all you want, but eventually if we reject God enough, we'll spend an eternity away from him because we wanted nothing to do with him here. We'll have nothing to do with him for all eternity. We can't describe hell enough. Hell is not a fun place to be. I always cringe when I hear people say, I'm going to go to hell and party with my friends. There will be no party in hell. I didn't mean to go down that rabbit trail today, but I did. So when I act in a way that is unrighteous, I'm not representing the king the way he would want me to, and I'm actually acting on the accord of my own behalf. Last week, or as we gathered together, I stated that when we act on our own behalf, outside of the king's behalf, we're literally acting on Satan's behalf. Anything outside of the behalf of the king is the, uh, is the behalf of our adversary that is constantly trying to steal, kill, and destroy. 2 Corinthians 9.10 says, now, we, now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. Wow, would you just look at that verse a minute? Isn't that a powerful verse? That's so powerful. And he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also, people of God, increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. So what is he saying? He's not only going to give you seed, he's going to enlarge your capacity to carry seed. He's going to give you a bigger purse, in other words. He's going to give you a bigger basket. He's going to give you a, a enlarge your heart. You know, in the natural, an enlarged heart is not a good thing. But in the spirit realm, having an enlarged heart gives us a greater capacity to carry the seed of the kingdom. Why? He's not interested in how much we carry. He's interested in how much we plant. And by the way, the feed one that we just did, that's planting seed. Planting seed in somebody's life that you'll probably never, ever meet this side of heaven, but you're actually helping them to survive and to know the love of God through your gift into their lives. So we have the capacity to be enlarged for carrying a great amount of seed so that we can have a greater harvest of righteousness. That word righteousness simply means to live right before the king in a, in a way that right wiseness is probably a, uh, an enlarged word of that, but to live in such a way that the king is honored by that. So he says that the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost, as we looked at a few weeks ago. So there's the word righteousness, but there's also this word peace. 
And when I break the bond of peace through discord in the body of Christ, I'm not demonstrating the nat nature of the king, but rather, again, my own nature. Whenever there's discord in the body of Christ, it's because somebody in the discord, one party or the other, is acting on behalf of their own good and not the behalf of the king. I always say in any marriage, marriage, there, any marriage that where both partners have the, have the Holy Spirit living in them, there should never be a breakdown in the marriage. The breakdown comes when one or both of the partners start wanting their own will above the will of the Father. By the way, the will of the Father isn't who, who wins. If one of you wins in the marriage, then you lost. If one of you wins in the marriage, you both lost. Because it's not him and her, you and, you and, you and her, or however that would go in your marriage. It's us. The two have become one in marriage. Well, I'm going on a lot of rabbit trails this morning, but these are good. Say, I'm going to say, thank you, Pastor. These are good. So the two have become one. And when they become one, this oneness is under the leadership of the Holy Spirit. And so there should never be a disagreement in the marriage that isn't run through the, the voice of the Holy Spirit, because when we do that, one of you who, who's wanting his own way or her own way will eventually say, you know what, I, I'm just going to bow out here. I'm going to submit here. I'm going to submit here for the common good of the marriage and for the peace in the marriage. And uh, it shouldn't always be the same partner, by the way. Just saying. If it is, we have issues in the marriage. As one partner is more dominant and the other one is maybe more spiritual. I don't know. Um, but submitting to one another so that the bond of peace, the scripture calls it the bond of peace, that gluing together, that thing that causes our hearts to be knit together with the Lord. Whenever you have a marriage that has two Holy Spirit filled people in there, there should always be harmony and peace in the home because you're both submitting to the, the leadership of the Holy Spirit and preferring one another, as the scripture says over and over again, to one another. So when I break the bond of peace, I cause discord. James puts it this way in 4.1, that what causes fights and quarrels among you? He says, don't they come from your desires that battle within you? That word desire is, is, uh, is the word lust. That's uh, the co lusting at the cost of somebody else. That I don't care what it costs you, I'm going to do this whether you like it or not. James says that's what causes fights and quarrels in marriages or in any relationship. I'm going to do my thing. And can I, can I just, I want to reemphasize this over and over and over again. We need to understand we're clashing the culture of the church. We're clashing our natural culture with the kingdom. And whenever we act outside of the kingdom principles, we act inside maybe a natural carnal way or we act in a religious way. And religion, religion isn't always kingdom. There's a lot of tradition in religion. So sometimes tradition gets in the way. But if we're acting in any way that uh, interrupts what the Spirit of God has for us, what the Scripture would have for us, then we're acting in a way that causes confusion in the body of Christ. And my desires, my lusts, when I superimpose those into a relationship, it automatically is going to bring heartache somewhere in the relationship. So I have to take my own lusts, my own desires, and I have to bring them before the throne of grace. You know, I just want to say this morning, before we go too far, that every one of us in this room have our own lusts. We all have our own desires. But because we have them doesn't make them right. And they all need to be submitted to the throne of grace. Amen? That's why we come to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and help in time of need. So that we can submit that before the Lord. So when I rob someone of their joy and bring discouragement or their ability to rejoice, I weaken the life of the body of Christ. I weaken my brothers and sisters that are here. When I bring discouragement into this body, I'm literally, it's like poking air in a balloon. You know, and it's just that slow draining of air coming out. And eventually it's deflated. The joy of the Lord is what? Is what? 
It's our air, right? It strengthens us. It builds us back up. It, it inflates us, if you will. It causes us to be an upright body of Christ, the joy of the Lord. You go around a bunch of people who, are, who have been just beat down and discouraged and hammered all the time, and just walk around with their head down. Oh, it's just life is not fun to be around. Terrible. But boy, to be, have your head lifted up because somebody encouraged you, the joy of the Lord brings great strength to our life. So it's vital for all of us to understand that we're not a solo act. Look at your neighbor this morning and say, I'm not a solo act. There are no islands in the kingdom. Amen? We need each other. We need each other. So we use our gifts for the good of others in any way that the Lord would want us to. And our obedience in using the gifts that we have given, excuse me, will affect others, whether it's good or bad. Every one of us in this room have gifts. Corinthians tells us that God gave gifts to men. And that's uh, not just men. Ladies, you have gifts. Uh, he's given them to us as human beings. We all have gifts. And we all, some of us have incredible gifts. Some of us have very subtle gifts that somebody doesn't see, but boy, they're so important. When I say things like that, I always think of like a little widow, widow lady who's, who's at home by herself all week and nobody ever sees her, but she's praying and pouring her heart out, heart out to God and just making holes in heaven with, with her intercession. Now, that's not someone who's standing up front with a beautiful voice singing or a pastor who's preaching a message or someone who's doing something that everybody sees, but there's a gift given that is being used for the glory of God. Amen? So we have these gifts, and how we use them are going to affect other people. And we need each part of the body. It's not that they're just gifts to be given, but those gifts are given because we need those gifts. We need the gifts in the body. I need the gifts that are in this body. I'm, I'm not an administrator. Uh, I'm a, more of a visionary. And so if you have a visionary without an administrator, you're a mess. You're all over the place. And so you need administrators to help bring stability to the vision, right? But what we, what we do... When we have a body that has limbs cut off it, it begin, begins to look really disfigured. We would call a body that has arms cut off or legs cut off, if we came on a crime scene, the investigators would say, we have a dismembered body. Uh, someone, someone went to horrific care to take the arms and legs off this torso. So we call it a dismembered body. Last week, Evan called it handicapped. Uh, I would say it's probably past handicap, it's dead. All right, you go cutting arms and legs off, it's probably just dead. But it's a dismembered torso. We're cutting, we're cutting people off from fellowship, if I look at you as though I don't need your gift, you look at me as though I, you don't need my gift, we're actually dismembering his body. We need to understand again and again and again, this is not you and me, it's us underneath him. He's the head, we're the body. Say that with me. He's the head, we're the body. One more time. He's the head, we're the body. And we need the body. Anytime any one of us are absent, it affects us. This is why Hebrews says you need to gather together even so all the more as you see the day of the Lord approaching. Say, well, I don't think I'll go to church today. I think I'll stay home. Well, what if you woke up one morning and your arm said, I think I'm just going to lay in bed today and I'm not going to go to work with you. And your right hand, and it happened to be your right arm that stayed home. How many know work wouldn't be too fun? What if you woke up one morning and your nose decided it was going to stay on the pillow and you went to work? See, we need each other. We need the parts of the body, don't we? We function properly when we're all together. 
Jesus said, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, do it in remembrance of me. I was at a retreat sometime uh, a few weeks back, and, and one young gentleman, as he was doing communion with us, made this statement, to remember. I want you to catch this. I just used the phrase or the term dismember. When we come to communion, what Jesus is saying, I want you to remember. Not just remind yourself, but to put the members back in place. Uh, to, to call ourselves together as the body again. To recognize that we are, we are one. Uh, we're, we're pulled out of that one body. When Jesus took the loaf, it was one body. He said, take and eat. This is my body. And he gave pieces to it. And it's a symbol of you and I being parts, pieces of the body of Christ. And Jesus says when we come to the communion table, what we're doing is we are putting ourselves back together under one. Our Savior, our Lord, Jesus Christ, who wants us to remember. It's a time of reconnecting, if you will. Remembering who we are. Remembering whose we are. Remembering who we are under. We're remembering Jesus. Amen? And would to God that more churches would do more remembering than dismembering. I'm getting an education at the, the gym. I was in the locker room changing and a guy beside me was pretty uh, pretty friendly guy and he said hi when I walked in I said hi back and and we got out on the machines and we crossed eyes and connected again and finally I'm in the sauna sweating and uh, he comes in and so we sit down and we start chatting some more and finally I find out he's a Christian and he goes to one of the churches in town here and I said, oh, I know your pastor. I'm not going to say the name of the church, and I hope I don't slip. <clears throat> I know your pastor. He's a great guy. And then he does this to me. I love your pastor. He's a wonderful man. Glad you think so. That's what he said. Uh, I'll, I'll probably end the conversation there. But what I was able to say to him later on after we got out of the sauna and got into the hot tub <laughs> I said, you know, you know what? You need to understand that when you talk about your pastor like that you're bringing disunity into your church. So you know what, you, you may not agree with your pastor, but let me say this to you. And I, I hope I'm not coming across too hard. You know, we just met each other. Hope I'm not coming across too hard. Oh, and by the way, I'm a pastor. He goes, oh. Uh, I hope I'm not coming across too hard, but you need to understand if you disagree with your pastor, that's one thing. But you talking with other people about it, and let me say this to you, that you disagreeing doesn't help the matter. You're actually making it worse. So if there's something you don't like about him and you're disagreeing and bringing other people in on that great disagreement, you're making what you're disagreeing about ten times worse because you're a body of Christ. I said, and, and this guy was a leader in this church, and I said, you're not helping to lead the church well. I hope he felt that, Cindy. I hope he felt that. Ooh. I, I really do. So he said, I can't wait to go home and call my pastor. I said, listen, listen, listen. If you're going to go home and call your pastor and tell him you met me, you better tell him what I told you. I don't know if he will or not. And I can't wait to see him next time. When I got to this point in my notes, I felt like the Holy Spirit wanted me to ask this question of us. Is there someone in the body that you either have intentionally or, dis, or, or unintentionally dismembered? Please don't tell me. But it's a question that's a probing question. Is there somebody in the body that you have dismembered?
Someone perhaps you wish wasn't in the body. And let me say this. If you're thinking really hard whether you have done that or not, then you probably haven't. But if a person, a face, came to your mind quickly, then you probably have. We, we generally call them EGRs. Little extra grace required people. But because they need a little extra grace doesn't make them any less part of the body. My, my toes are not real pretty. Some people have pretty toes. I'm always envious of pretty toes. When I see people on the beach, I notice weird things. You got really nice toes. That's because I'm aware of how unnice mine are. But because they're unnice, I don't cut them off. I don't dismember my foot. There are parts of the body that are less honorable, the scripture says, right? Less honorable. But we need them. Is there someone in the body you have an issue with? Let's probe a little further. Have you ever stopped to think about the part that that person plays in the body? I mean the one that you have an issue with. Have you ever stopped to think about the part that they play in the body? Instead of trying to dismember or resist them, have you ever asked the Lord to let you see them through his eyes? Wow, that would change your perspective really fast. Amen? And let me go a little bit deeper. And could it be that the Lord has placed that individual in your life to help you temper your issues? The very fact that they grate you may be an indicator that the Lord's using them to fashion you. And so instead of looking at them as someone who needs to be dismembered, embrace them as someone who is helping you to become a better part of the body of Christ. How many know that's a little different perspective than what we usually look at? And it may be that all the issues we think they have are indeed our issues. And the scripture puts it this way, why are you so concerned about the speck in your brother's eye when you've got a plank in your own? Those are pretty drastic analogies, aren't they? Speck, plank. Can you imagine walking around with a plank? So we've got this big plank in our eye, and I'm trying to focus on the speck in your eye, and I'm belting you with my plank, trying to get your speck out. And so James calls it the mirror of the word. If we would stop looking at everybody else's speck and start looking at the scripture, the Holy Spirit would reveal what needs to be changed in our life, and the EGRs in our life wouldn't seem so irritating anymore. So if you have an EGR, thank God, because God loves you enough to give you one, because you got issues. Anybody have issues? Can we just confess that today? Lord, I have issues. Come on, let's say it. Lord, I have issues. And Holy Spirit, I want you to deal with my issues so I don't have to deal with a bunch of EGRs in my life. <laughs> the Holy Spirit is so much better at dealing with our issues.
Can you say amen? amen? So many times I've been in prayer, oblivious to my issues. And the Holy Spirit is like a spotlight that comes and he invades my prayer time from time to time. And all of a sudden he finds this area of my heart that gets illumined. And I find myself broken in his presence. I literally weep. And the reason I weep is because he's so gentle in showing me my issues. By that I mean God is never condemning. He doesn't put the spotlight on it and go, You dirtbag, look at how disgusting you are. It's more like a father saying, You know what, I've noticed this in your life. And don't you think it's time we take care of that? Ah, uh, yeah. Wow, I didn't see that, Spirit of God. Thank you. Thank you for pointing that out. And because you pointed it out, you're obviously wanting to deal with it right now. So can we get this done? Can we just deal with my arrogance? Can we deal with my pride? Can we deal with my loss? Can we deal, you know, whatever our issues are, can we deal with it right now, God? If he puts the spotlight on it, it's because he wants to take care of it. And if you refuse to take care of it, he'll put EGRs in your life. They're like irritants. They're like that little grain of sand in the oyster, right? The goal is to make something beautiful out of our lives. On a broader scale, how about people of other denominations that express themselves differently than you do? We, we are judging them by the denomination they come out of rather than the issue of their heart, the condition of their heart. And I have noticed over the last many years hanging out with some of our Methodist, Presbyterian, Mennonite, and so forth, Dove Fellowship, different guys that, uh, brethren that I hang out with that I had arrogant issues against. And the Holy Spirit has reprimanded me severely over the last few years. I remember one of my dear friends now, his name is Jerry Roth, I'll just say it right out. He pastors Chambersburg Mennonite Church, a dear friend of mine. I love Jerry. He's, a, he's an incredibly uh, meek, mild-mannered man, but he's deeply spiritual. I remember one day as I sat around the table with him, I'm going to just confess something to you today, okay, so you can see how this works. I remember sitting around the table and looking over at Jerry. How many know Jerry Roth? Okay, so some of you know what I mean when I say this. Jerry Roth is about the most laid-back guy I know on the planet. Uh, literally, while we're sitting around the table, I'm watching him thinking, this guy is just going to fall asleep, he's so laid-back. I mean, he's just like a... And I remember, I remember one occasion sitting around the table thinking this thought. How in the world does that personality pastor a church? And as soon as I thought that thought, I mean, I'm falling asleep just watching you, dude. But as soon as I thought that thought, listen to what the Holy Spirit said. The Holy Spirit spoke to my heart very, very strongly and he said, it's his humility and meekness that I'm using in the body of Christ. Jerry had no idea that conversation was going on in my head. But I'm sitting across the table and now tears are streaming down my face. And I'm like, God, forgive me. God, forgive me. How arrogant of me to think that somehow God can't use a different personality type. Amen? Amen? And shortly after that, Jerry invited me, unbeknownst of my Holy Spirit conversation, to speak at his church for a revival service. And I just chuckled to myself and I said, God, you're so cool. <laughs> but he's one of our dear friends today. He and his wife, Anna, are dear friends of ours and we love them. I love the writing of Max Lucado. Years ago, I was somewhere and I heard... Max speak and he gave this description of the body of Christ denominationally and he used the illustration of a ship 
And it's a little different than what I'm going to read to you, but similar in some ways. There's some humor in it, but there's also some deep truth in this. And let me read it to you. I tried to find the version that he spoke at that conference I was at, but this is a little different, but it's, it's, it's still really good. God has enlisted us in his navy and placed us on his ship. And all the Navy guys said, Amen. The boat has one purpose, and that's to carry us safely to the other shore. This is not a cruise ship. It's a battleship. We aren't called to a life of leisure. We're called to a life of service. Each of us on the ship have a different task. Some concern themselves with those who are drowning and snatching people from the water. That's all they do all day. Others are occupied with the enemy, so they man the cannons of prayer and worship. And feel like that's all they need to do all day is pray and worship. Still others devote themselves to the crew, feeding them, training them, so that they can function properly, properly while on the ship. Though different, we are all the same. Each can tell of a personal encounter they had with the captain, for each has received their own personal call. He found us among the shanties of the seaport and invited us to follow him. Our faith was born at the sight of his fondness, and so we went, we followed. We each followed him across that gangplank of his grace, gangplank of his grace onto the same boat. There's one captain, there's one destination. Though the battle is fierce and the boat is safe, for our captain is God, the ship will not sink. For that there is never any concern. There is concern, however, regarding the disharmony of the crew. When the first we first boarded, we assumed the crew was made up of others just like us. But as we've wandered these decks, we've encountered curious converts and curious appearances. Some wear uniforms, sporting styles that we've never witnessed. Let your imagination run wild. Why do you look that way, we ask. Funny, they replied. We were wondering the same about you. The variety of dress is not merely a, as disturbing as the plethora of opinions on the ship. There is a group, for example, who clusters every morning for serious study. They promote rigid discipline and somber expressions. We don't laugh in church. Church is serious. Serving the captain is serious business, they would explain. It's no coincidence that they tend to congregate around the stern of the boat. There is another regiment deeply devoted to prayer. Not only do they believe in prayer, they believe in prayer by kneeling. And for that reason, you always find them located near the bow of the ship. And there are a few who staunchly believe that real wine should be used at the Lord's Supper. You'll find them on the port side. Still another group has positioned themselves near the engine. They spend hours examining the nuts and the bolts of the boat. They've been known to go below deck and not come up for days. They're occasionally criticized by those who linger on the top deck, feeling the wind in their hair and the sun on their face. It's not what you learn, those topside argue. It's what you really feel that matters, those Pentecostals. Ah, oh, how we tend to cluster all over the ship. Some think once you're on the boat, you can't get off. 
Others say you'd be foolish to go aboard, but the choice is always yours. Some believe you volunteer for service. Others believe you were destined for the service before the ship was even built. Some predict a storm of great tribulation will strike before we dock. Others say it won't be until we hit safely on the other shore. There are those who speak to the captain in a personal language. And there are those who think such languages are extinct and not meant to be on the ship at all. Interesting, isn't it? Doesn't that paint a beautiful picture? Of the body of Christ, and maybe disturbing picture in some ways? I'm thankful over the last 10 years of my life to see what I refer to as denominational walls starting to be taken down. At least here in Chambersburg, I'm witnessing it happening. And may the Lord help us here at Christian Life not to be so arrogant to think that we're the only ones on the boat. We have brothers and sisters all over our community that are fellowshipping in different churches. Amen? Turn with me quickly to 1 Corinthians 12. 12, 12. I'll end with this passage. The body is a unit, though it's made up of many parts. And though all its parts are many, they form one body. So it is with Christ. Isn't it interesting that we can read that and say, we get it. And it's just as I was reading that, I was thinking, that's kind of what we do to the Trinity, isn't it? We think... Oh, the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the three, but they're one. Like, we, we, can't, we can't get that. Well, why can we get this so easy? There's many parts, but we're one. Different functions, right? If we were all baptized by one Spirit into one body, whether Jew or Greek, slave or free, and we were all given the one Spirit to drink, now the body is not made up of one part, but many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason cease to be part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason cease to be part of the body. I want to suggest to us that that's an inferiority complex that many of us have. Some of you are in this room today and you've experienced great failure in your life great setbacks in your life, in your personal quiet life that nobody else sees, there's areas of your life where you continue to fail over and over and over again, and you've allowed shame to cripple who you are in the body of Christ. And you've allowed the enemy to say, because I am not that, therefore I cease to be part of the body. I want to say to us this morning that the grace of God is sufficient. Amen? Mr. Potato Head, if the ear was to come off and say, because I'm not an eye, I must not be part of the body. Please understand, we are a body. We need each other. And if the hand should say, because I'm not a nose, I am not a part of the body. All of a sudden, we start looking pretty weird, don't we? And if the eye should say, because I'm not the feet, I don't belong to the body. And on and on it goes. Whoever you are here today, you've allowed... Is Aaron Pittman in the house this morning? Is he here? Did he just left? Aaron is one of our board members, and he shared a devotion with us the other night at our board meeting that was so powerful about shame, how shame disconnects you from the body. Shame, shame tells you you are no good. Guilt tells you you did something wrong, but shame tells you you're no good. And when we hear 
the enemy, the adversary, tell us long enough that we're no good, we literally feel like we don't belong as part of the body of Christ. I want you to, somebody needs to hear this in this room this morning. We literally feel like, okay, I can't be part of the body because I'm no good. My shame has told me a lie. I'm no good. Do you have issues? Yeah, you probably have issues. But that's nothing you and the Holy Spirit can't tackle. And because of the issue, you've disconnected yourself from the body and feel like you have no value or input into the body, even though you're hanging out with the body. It's, you almost feel like a, a, a piece of exterior clothing, like a hat to put on or a pair of gloves to put on. From time to time, you connect with the body, but you're just seasonal. You don't really feel like you're part of the body. I'm here to tell you this morning that if you're a born-again believer and you've got issues, you're still a born-again believer. Uh, let, me, let me just change that up a little bit. Look around you. If that's you that I'm talking about this morning, I want you to look around because the rest of us have issues. And if we all disconnected because we had issues, we would look like Mr. Potato had stripped down. Right? No life in it. Not able to do anything. So I want to say to those of you that are here today and you're feeling shame, get rid of the shame, take that jacket off, put on his righteousness. It's not what you do that's good anyway that makes you who you are in Christ. It's what he's already done. Somebody say amen to that this morning. And when he's already done all the work, he's already paid the price for your sin, he's already covered it in the blood, then you don't have to worry about it other than you and the Holy Spirit making sure that you're keeping your heart pure and clean before the Lord, best of your ability. I hope that meant to somebody to somebody, because I really feel like the Holy Spirit wanted to say that to somebody today. That inferiority complex. 17 says the whole body, if the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of smell, or of, where would the sense of hearing be, excuse me? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? He addresses the superiority complex here. But in fact, God has arranged the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? If all of us today were up here preaching, who would listen to us? Amen? If all of us were on the platform singing this morning, some of you are saying, oh, you don't want me singing. And we're saying, we don't either. <laughs> but as it is, there are many parts. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. Are you feeling weak this morning? You're feeling like you're not a significant part of the body? The Bible says that you're indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unrepresentable, uh, unpresentable, excuse me, are, are treated with special modesty. Where, where our presentable parts need no special treatment, but God has combined the members of the body as given greater honor to the parts that lack it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. The eye should say to the hand, Hey, hand, how are you doing today? Oh, I'm doing great. Well, that's really good. It's good to see you here today. And the ear should say, hey, little toe, how are you doing today? I'm doing pretty good. Stuffed in this sock down here, but I'm doing really good. Because I need them. We don't think about our toes very much, but if you chopped your toes off, you know how unbalanced you would be? We'd be calling you Eileen. <laughs> yes, dear, I hear you. I don't even have to look. I don't even have to look. I 
hear it. <laughs> now you are the body of Christ. And each one of you is a part of it. Now you are the body of Christ. And each one of you is a part of it. Now you are the body of Christ. And each one of you is a part of it. Now you are the body of Christ. And each one of you is a part of it. Now you are the body of Christ. And each one of you is a part of it. Now you are the body of Christ. Now you are the body of Christ. And each one of you is a part of it. Now you are the body of Christ. And each one of you is a part of it. Look at your neighbor with the cheesiest smile you can muster up and say, I'm glad you're part of the body. <laughs> real quick, real quick. Have you hid your gift lately? Have you hid your gift lately? Have you been operating on your own accord? Do you know what your gifts are? Have you been using them for the king's sake? Is there a need of righteousness in your life in a greater way? And how about peace or joy? Any of those lacking in your life? Has the enemy stolen your joy because you've placed your trust in someone other than God? I would like for the altars to be filled today. In my mind, I saw us all just filling the altar saying, God... Forgive me for the many times that I have not recognized that I'm part of the body or tried to dismember your body because of my preferences. And would you bow your head this morning? <clears throat> and would you just reflect for a few moments on the message and whatever part of the message might have somehow pricked your heart? And ask the Holy Spirit to minister His grace to your life. Thank you, Jesus. I want you just to say to, to the Holy Spirit this morning, I am part of the body of Christ. Some of you are going to have a hard time saying that because you still don't really believe it. I am part of the body of Christ. I am part of the body of Christ. Keep hearing that Penn State chant in the back of my head. We are Penn State. No, we are the body of Christ. And if we can chant that at a football field, can't we chant that in church? I am the body of Christ. Come on, let's say that together. I am the body of Christ. That's not bad for a peewee game, but come on, we're in the big leagues today. I am the body of Christ. Some of them need to say it like you really believe it. I am a part of the body of Christ. I am the body of Christ. So Holy Spirit, we thank you that you have grafted all of us mongrels into this incredible body all of our weaknesses and insufficiencies as we see them so often. Yet you loved us so much that you gave yourself up for us. Can't fully fathom that, God, but we just want to say thank you today. Thank you for making me part of the body of Christ. Forgive us for any way that we might have dismembered someone from your body. We didn't deserve to be here ourselves, and here we are judging others, though, whether they should or shouldn't be. 
So we take the beam out of our eye today and stop looking at the speck in somebody else's. We ask you, God, to bring a spirit of unity upon the body of Christ around the, the, the United States and around the globe, Lord, that there, the body of Christ would rise up as one body. We thank you, Jesus. I was on the treadmill at the gym the other day speaking with a young lady, and I said, well, how cool would it be if the body of Christ in Chambersburg just did something together? Like, how powerful could the body of Christ be if we stopped dismembering each other because of the denomination that they're in? Imagine how powerful the Chambersburg body of Christ would be. I was at a conference not too long ago. And while I was at the altar of the conference, I felt impressed by the Holy Spirit to um, come home and emboss in the carpet here the word unity. It was so strong in my heart, like I, I felt like I wanted to leave the conference right there and come and carve the letters out of the carpet. It was that strong for me. And I, I remember coming home and the very next work day I called the carpet place and told them what I wanted to do. And he said, sure, I'll send somebody out that week. Well, they never showed up. By the end of the week, I forgot about it. And uh, the Holy Spirit reminded me of it again a few weeks back. And so I called another carpet place. Interesting, superior flooring. <laughs> showed up. And so sometime in the near future, you're going to come in and you're going to see the word unity embossed in the carpet here. And I want that to be how Christian life is identified as a body of believers who have the spirit of unity in their midst. And we're in this together. I do need you. And you need me. How crazy is that? <laughs> May the Lord bless you. Go bless somebody this week and take an invitation card. Invite somebody. God bless you.